Welcome to morning uh, verse by verse Bible study. We have come to the 31st verse of the 19th, uh, 20th chapter of Acts. We are supposed to carry on from verse 32, but uh, I told you last time I would uh, spend some time on the 30th and 31st verse to elaborate upon it because a lot of uh, reason, things we can learn from that. And so I'll go back to the 30th and 31st verse. But before that, I remember I had given you some homework to do. I will ask you to prepare a mission statement. Your life mission statement. What is the purpose of your life? And uh, as you have a mission statement, you go about fulfilling that mission. And I also promised you that I will share with you my mission statement uh, for my life. So I'm going to uh, I'll tell you the mission statement. And you can maybe, uh, those who's doing close captioning today, uh, you can just write down, uh, type on the uh, text, type the type text of my mission statement. Mission statement is, uh, to be an obedient faithful and effective instrument of God, leading people to saving knowledge of Christ, and also encourage those in Christ to intimate walk with God. Let me repeat. To be an obedient, faithful, and effective instrument of God, leading, Gentiles, leading people to saving knowledge of Christ, and also encourage those in Christ to an intimate walk with God. That's my mission statement. So it's twofold. Uh, gospel to people of other faiths and uh, encouraging people in Christ to a close walk with God. A third calling is also encouraging pastors, but I have not put that in the mission statement. That's uh, actually, it came much later, but this is my simple mission statement. So I hope you can write down the mission statement. If you have not already done so, by this weekend, please do it. So you have a clear vision, purpose for your life and go about fulfilling that purpose. Okay. Before we go to the 32nd verse, I want to throw some light on the 30th and 31st verse. The Apostle Paul was in Ephesus for three years. And three years he served the Lord there with humility and tears. And he warned the church members about certain people who are going to come there and draw people after themselves. They'll cause disunity in the body of Christ. He refers to them as savage wolves. Now Jesus told, told the disciples, I'm sending you uh, sending you uh, to people who are wolves in sheep's clothing. There will be people, wolves in sheep's clothing. And here Paul refers to them as savage wolves. Who appear to be like sheep, but they're actually wolves. And he said, even said from your own number, from the church, from the congregation, some will take away people out of themselves and run away. See, he warned them about distributing the body of Christ. Division in the body of Christ. He warned them. Now, this was sometime around AD 61 when Paul went to Ephesus. He was there for three years. Subsequently, he went away from there and from Rome in prison, he wrote a letter to the Ephesians a few years later. And this is called one of, this was one of the uh, prison letters. Colossians, Philippians, Ephesians, and Philemon are referred to as prison letters. The letters of Paul are classified into four categories. Gospel letters, Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, and Galatians. Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, and Galatians. That is called the gospel letters. Prison letters are Colossians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Philemon. Then the third category are Pastoral letters, pastoral letters. First Timothy, Second Timothy, and Titus were the pastors. Timothy was a pastor in Ephesus, and uh, Titus was a pastor or elder in Cyp in, sorry, in Crete. In Crete, the fourth category are second coming letters or, or parousia. Parousia means second coming, and those letters are two letters: First Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians. Total thirteen letters, four gospel letters. Four prison letters, three pastor letters, and two parasol letters. So, efficiency is part of prison letters. From prison in Rome, he wrote a letter to them. In that letter, he again gives them a solution to how to avoid division in the church, how to be one. Now, I'm going to request uh, Sushma to read Ephesians chapter 4, verses uh, uh, 2 to 7. Ephesians 4, chapter 2 to 7. Remember, after warning them while he was in Ephesus for three years, 
in prison Rome writing them a letter and telling them how to handle possible divisions in the church. Please read that about unity in the body of Christ. For all of us, it's very important to understand. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 2 to 7. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Seven also. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. A simple formula, how to avoid disunity in the church, how to be one. And he writes to them and says, be hum completely humble and gentle, verse 2. And make every unity of the spirit the bond of peace. So he writes to them and reminding them, please be one. Don't cause divisions. Don't move away from, from, from God and draw, run behind people. Now, this was sometime in AD 64. After he was in Ephesus, three years he warned them. Then he got arrested, went to Rome, and in Britain went to Jerusalem. So many things happened in Britain. From Rome, writes a letter to them about how to avoid disunity, how to be one. Did they listen to him or not? Yes, they listened to him because later on we read, in AD 90, John had a revelation. Island of Patmos. And he writes about that the revelation. And there, God spoke to John, about the church in Ephesus. Let's read Revelation chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. Revelation chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. Yes, you, you tested, tested, uh, tested those who claim to be apostles but are false, found them false. In other words, they realize that these are savage wolves, drawing people of themselves, so they are not prophets, they are false prophets. And they tested them, found them false. So they listened to the advice of the apostle Paul. Some might have gone away, but then... Because the warnings Paul gave them while in Ephesus, then the letter from Rome, they listened to him and finally God said, I know you tested those who can be apostles, but are not, and found them for. They were savage wolves, not apostles. And therefore, they listened to the advice of Paul given by the Holy Spirit, and the church was attacked. The fourth chapter of Ephesians was 1 to 7, is a simple formula, biblical recipe for keeping the oneness in the body of Christ. And I wish all, all churches can follow that, how nice it will be when all one in Christ, but then there will be a, God's blessing to be showered upon a church which is one in Christ. Okay, let's go on from so 32. So 32. He tells them, remember he's talking to the efficient elders at a place called Miletus. The last time he's seeing them, he's going to go to Jerusalem, he's going to get arrested, and they'll never see them again. So 32. Now I come to you to God, and the word of his grace, which can build you up and give an inheritance among those who are sanctified. I'm committing you to God. I'm going away now, and I'm living in the Lord's hands. Not only to commit you to God, to the word of his grace, which will build you up. Paul went away. The word remains. In Thessalonica, for example, he was there for three Sabbath days, but probably two weeks or three weeks. He went away. For those people who listened to Paul, took the word very, very seriously. And therefore, they were secure in Christ and they grew in spite of the Apostle Paul not being there. They took the word of God very, very seriously. Uh, Sushma, could read the first Thessalonians, chapter 2, verse 13. At least in Ephesus, he was there for three years. In Thessalonica, only three weeks. Three Sabbath days, he was there. Then he went away. But then when they heard him speak, the Thessalonians, they took it very seriously and therefore, they were secure in the Lord. The 1 Thessalonians? Chapter 2, verse 13. 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 13. And we also thank God continually because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as it is actually the word of God, which is at work in you who believe. The work in you believe. So they listened to Paul's message and they tested it. They found it from God, they, uh, like the Bereans. 
And they took it very seriously, not as a word of men, as a word of God, but it work in those who believe. And how does it work? It builds us up. God's word always builds. Always encourages, comforts, builds up people. So here Paul is writing, I'm coming to you to God. I was, I'm going away now. You'll never see me again. Coming to you to God and to the word of his grace, which will build you up. And give an inheritance among those who are sanctified. Very beautiful verses. As you take God those seriously, we get built up and we get sanctified and we are sure of our inheritance. Verse 33. I have not covered, coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourself know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. He's telling, he's reminding them, see, when I was with you, I was not a burden to you. I worked my own living. And Paul was actually a tent maker. That's why when he was in Corinth, read the uh, uh, 18, 18 chapter of Acts, the first three verses, how when he was in Corinth, he met Aquila and Priscilla, who were also tent makers. They were actually originally from uh, Rome. And Claudius sent them away from Rome, while the Jews sent them away. They went to uh, Pontus and they lived there for some time. Then they went to Corinth. That's where Paul met them. And they are tent makers. And since Paul was also a tent maker, Paul stayed with them. And he was the one and a half years we know in Corinth. And he was a tent maker. He was doing his tent making profession. Plus, he was an apostle. And sometimes people do that. They choose not to take the rights as an apostle or as a servant of God. And they work for their own uh, living, the hands. And he goes on to say, Verse 34, you yourself know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs, needs of my companions. And everything I did, I showed that by this kind of hard work, you must help the weak. Remembering the Lord's birth, the Lord Jesus himself, it's more blessed to give than to receive. So the apostle was telling them that I work for my own living. I didn't cover anyone's silver or gold or clothing. Now we must understand one thing, that when you serve in the ministry, you have a right to... Uh, get your living from the ministry. Let's look at uh, a long passage, but it's very important to understand. Paul was a tent maker. He was doing his profession, but he had the right to use the money uh, people gave him. He didn't use it for himself. He didn't use the right. Let's read First Corinthians, a long passage, chapter 9, 7 to 18. And as uh, Shushma reads, please follow very carefully in your Bibles and go and take out some gems from it and uh, understand scriptures. First Corinthians 9, chapter 7 to 18. Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and does not eat of its grapes? Who tends a flock and does not drink of the milk? Do I say this merely from a human point of view? Doesn't the law say the same thing? For it is written in the law of Moses, do not muscle an ox while it is treading out the grain. Is it about oxen that God is concerned? Surely he says this for us, doesn't he? Yes, this was written for us because when the plowman plows and the thresher threshes, they ought to do so in the hope of sharing in the harvest. If we have sown spiritual seed among you, is it too much if we reap a material harvest from you? If others have this right of support from you, shouldn't we have it all the more? But we did not use this right. On the contrary, we put up with anything rather than hinder the gospel of Christ. Don't you know that those who work in the temple get their food from the temple and those who serve at the altar share in what is offered on the altar? In the same way, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. But I have not used any of these rights and I am not writing this in the hope that you will do such things for me. I would rather die than have anyone deprive me of this boast. Yet when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast, for I am compelled to preach. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. If I preach voluntarily, I have a reward. If not voluntarily, I am simply discharging the trust committed to me. What then is my reward? Just this, that in preaching the gospel, I may offer it free of charge, and so not make use of my rights in preaching it. Otherwise, what he's saying is, everybody who is in the ministry has a right to the Reaping from the ministry, uh, financial blessing. But he said, I'm not using this right. I must understand how uh, the contributions people make to God should be used. 
If you look, at, let's go look once again at 13 and 14. The 13th verse talks about Old Testament giving. I could read that, uh, Sushma, and I explain 13th verse, then we go to 14th verse. 1 Corinthians 9, 13. Don't you know that those who work in the temple get their food from the temple and those who serve at the altar share in what is offered on the altar? Okay, that's the Old Testament giving. They all brought their tithes and offerings to the temple and gave it in the temple. So used by uh, people who serve in the temple, who work in the temple, these are the Levites. Actually read in the Bible how the tithes were utilized. People gave the tithes and offerings. Tithes is one-tenth. More, more than one-tenth is an offering. Sacrifice, offerings, and tithes. Now, in 26th chapter of Deuteronomy, verse 12, we read about how this tithing was given to the Levites, the aliens, the fatherless, and the widows. That was used by the people in the temple who collected the money for the Levites for their sustenance. Levites as priests in the temple who served in the temple, get the food from the temple. Not only the Levites, tithes were given also to the aliens, fatherless or orphans and widows. And today in our context, who are the aliens? The refugees from other countries who come. The war refugees come to a country and then we have to provide for them because they don't have an income. They've thrown away from the land. And aliens today in our context are refugees. So people serving in the ministry, refugees, orphans, and widows. They were, they were the beneficiaries of the tithes in the Old Testament time. Now let's read verse 14. Nine chapter verse 14 of 1 Corinthians. In the same way, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. In other words, those who are in the ministry have a right to uh, the suggestion to the contribution made to the ministry. So it's for the kingdom of God. And of course, some people don't use the rights. When they are working in a secular organization, they don't use the rights. And after I became a believer, 19 years, I was serving God. But apart from my work, with my work, I was serving God. So I never took any contribution from anybody. 19 years, I had my salary. Then God called me for full-time ministry. Now, of course, people contribute. I form Logos Ministries, and then people contribute. And so, nothing wrong with that. In the case of the Apostle Paul, he didn't use the rights. I have a right to it, but then I don't want to be burdened to you. And, of course, there are people contribute to the ministry, but he gave it away to other needs. So, very important to understand the primary purpose of giving tithes and offerings. Tithes is mandatory. Not tithing is basically disobedience to God. It is robbing God, actually robbing God. So when people tell me, brother, I pay my tithes, I tell them, oh, you're not a robber. Very good. Not being a robber is not a qualification. It's not a qualification, not being a robber. If you don't give a tithe, you're a robber. When you pay your tithes, you're not a robber. And giving starts after tithing. So in the Old Testament time, they gave their tithes, offerings, sacrifices to the temple. And today, we give to the kingdom of God. Anywhere you can give, you pray about it. Wherever, and the principle behind giving is where you get a spiritual food from, that's where you give your uh, offerings and tithes. Now, let's look at the Apostle Paul's financial support that he got. Which is beautiful it is. Please read 2 Corinthians 8, chapter 1 to 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1 to 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 to 3. And now, brothers, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. Out of the most severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. Repeat that once again, slowly. Beautiful it is. Out of there, go ahead, out please. Of, out of the most severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. Overflowing jaw, extreme pot, well done, generosity. Then go on and then, uh, subsequently, uh, verses. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the saints. Oh, and wonderful. They, they pleaded with Paul. We want to give you for your ministry. We want to give you to contribute to the period of sharing in the ministry. Yes, go on. And they did not do as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us in keeping with God's will. 
So we must understand that when we serve God, we don't have to do fundraising. God raised funds for us. He'll move people's hearts to give. That's Paul's ministry. And Paul went through periods when he was financially poor, financially very, very prosperous. He could handle everything. Now let's read, let's read uh, Philippians chapter uh, 4, verse 11 to 13. Now the 13th verse is very, very, very familiar because all of us know. I can do all things to him who gives me strength. But in what context is he saying that? He's saying the context of at that time going through financial needs. He didn't have enough money at that time. Context that he said, I can do everything to him who gives me strength. So please read Philippians 4, chapter 11 to 13. I'll just come back. Philippians 4, 11 to 13. I am not, I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, I know, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. So in that context, Paul is saying, I'm not in because I'm in need. I'm in need right now, but the letter is not appeal for funds. I can do everything to him who gives me strength. And what is that plenty? What is it be need? Earlier, he had plenty. Now he was in need. But then he knew one thing. God give me strength. So when he was uh, prosperous, he gave away to people. When he was poor, you know what he did? Let's look at those who were also. Very important. Let's read First Timothy chapter 6, verses 17 to at uh, the end of the chapter. First Timothy, and this is what Paul did when he was rich, when he had a lot of money. He, whatever he taught, he practiced it. And here, this is what he advised Timothy, and he practiced it. First Timothy chapter 6. Verse 17 onwards. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that may, they may take hold of the life that is truly life. So what Paul taught and he, and he preached, he practiced it. We all know that very well. And uh, in, to, to uh, the Corinthian church, he wrote, and in First Corinthians fourth chapter, sixteen seventeen, I urge you to imitate me. Timothy will remind you about the way of life in Christ Jesus, which I believe what I teach everywhere in every church. What I teach everywhere in every church, he will remind you that I'm practicing it. So what when he spoke about how to handle rich people, when he was rich, he gave away. He enjoyed wealth also. He also gave away, and took out of life with his truly life. So when you have enough resources, you give away. Keep what is necessary, give away remaining. What did Paul do when he was poor? Now let's read 2 Corinthians 6 chapter 6 to 8. 2 Corinthians 6 chapter 6 to 8. 2 Corinthians 6 verses 6 to 8. In purity, understanding, and patience and kindness in the Holy Spirit and in sincere love, in truthful speech and in the power of God, with weapons of righteousness in the right hand and in the left. It was so, 10, actually. It was 10. Yeah. Go ahead. Please go ahead. Through glory and dishonor, bad report and good report, genuine yet regarded as impostors, known yet regarded as unknown, dying and yet we live on beaten and yet not killed, sorrowful yet always rejoicing, poor yet making many rich, having nothing and yet possessing everything. This is what he is writing about his ministry, what all he went through. Look at verse 10. Poor yet making many rich. When he financially rich, he was giving away to other people, kept for what was necessary, kept for himself. When he was poor, being others rich. How wonderful. When he was financially poor, Made others, he made others spiritually rich, focusing entirely on the ministry. That was ministry. So when he had financial difficulties, after giving away much of his wealth, he was poor. He didn't write about, oh, give me money. He said, I know what is to have plenty, what is being need. I can do everything to him, give me strength. Now, when I'm when I'm financially poor, I have strength to face the situation. 
That's ministry. That's a biblical ministry in terms of how much important for people to learn that in today's context. That God do fundraising for us, don't have to do fundraising. So here you work himself, hard for his own living, for 35, I repeat. In everything I did, I showed that by the kind of hard work we must help the weak, remembering both the Lord Jesus himself, is blessed, or rather it is more blessed to give than to receive. It's more blessed to give than to receive. To receiving is blessing. People bless you, or you're blessed by that. It's more blessed to give than to receive. More than receiving, giving is a blessing. Because when you give, you're blessed, meaning you're happy. Happy to give. That's a Christian ministry. And these words of Jesus, which he's quoting, it's not recorded actually in the, in the Gospels, this particular statement of Jesus. But somehow he got to know that Jesus said that. And remember, Paul never met Jesus when he was physically alive on earth. Paul came to know Jesus after Christ was crucified and resurrected. When he walked his word, the Lord Jesus Christ, Paul had never met him. Peter, James, and John had an intimate fellowship with God, with Jesus, while he walked his earth. Not Paul. Only after Jesus rose from the dead, he had an encounter with Jesus. But he remembered what he must have heard from other people, what Jesus said, is more blessed to give than to receive. This statement is not recorded in the Gospels. Verse 36. When he said this, he knelt down with all of them and prayed at the beach at Miletus. That he had come there, he was about to go on the way voyage to uh, Israel, Jerusalem, and he calls them from Ephesus to the uh, town of Miletus, port, city, port town of Miletus. They, they all wept as they embraced him and kissed him. What we the most was his statement that they would never see his face again. Then they accompanied him to the ship. Ship is heading outside. He called them from Ephesus. They came there. He shares the message. Beautiful message, isn't it? Short message. How many, how many verses is it? Let us see. From where, which, which one we started. We, uh, from uh, this message to the elders, it actually begins with verse 17 to verse 35. That's all. 18 verses. So profound, so deep in content. A fable message. Just 18 verses. They all kneel down and they all weep because he's going away. Okay, they would see him in heaven, but not on this earth. And somehow the Apostle Paul knew that the last time they, he's going to see them. As I said last time, Amos chapter 3, verse 7 is written, Surely the Sovereign Lord does nothing the revealing is, is plans to serve as the prophets. So he reveals plans. Maybe sometime he may tell us also when he's going to leave this world. He has not told me that yet. <laughs> but I know I'll live long and serve him. But one day he'll tell me. Before I go, I'm sure he'll tell me. Time has come. Back up. Back up means what do you take from here? Nothing, actually. Yes, we, we take people whom we minister to will be our reward with heaven. So we pack up those people. They'll come later, but there'll be a reward, a glory in heaven when we go to heaven. Maybe you can read that. Let's read our first uh, uh, Thessalonians chapter 2, uh, 19 and 20. First Thessalonians chapter 2, 19 and 20. First Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 19 and 20. For what is our hope, our joy, or the crown in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes? Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and joy. People who minister to in this world, we, we are instrumental in building them up in the Lord and sharing the gospel, they'll be our crown in heaven. We don't take our houses, we don't take our wealth, not everything we leave behind. And therefore, praise God for that. And maybe God revealed, he revealed to uh, Timothy. Uh, he revealed to Paul, which he revealed to Timothy. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. The time has come for my departure, he says. Time has come. He knew his departure. But he also knew at this time he would never see the Ephesian, Ephesian elders again. But this beautiful passage was 18 to uh, 32, the message to the elders in Ephesus. And then he takes leave of them and goes away. And of course, we'll all meet in heaven. We'll all meet them also. First of all, I want to meet Jesus. <laughs> all of us want to see Jesus. Then we see our near and dear ones in heaven and all the other uh, the people of God in the Bible. We'll all be seeing each other there in heaven. And it'll be a wonderful Union in heaven. God bless you all. And we'll carry on from the next verse uh, uh, on Monday. God bless you.